modern society is making men weak and stupid. The evidence is right in front of our faces. Men are falling behind women in every way that counts. We've seen a decline in traditionally male jobs in manufacturing and heavy industry. That's hit working class men particularly hard. But also the education system is really now failing many of our boys. Today, only 40% of college graduates are men. Men are three times more likely to die from mental health issues. 90% of the homeless population are male. And over 30% of young men aren't sexually active at all compared to just 19% 20 years ago. It should be clear to everyone by now that society is waging a war on masculinity and it's destroying men's minds and their will. People are getting weaker and dumber, but how did this actually happen? Well, you can thank one man for our modern idiocracy and his name was Edward Bernays. Despite changing the course of history entirely, Bernays is often forgotten today. As the nephew of Sigmund Freud, he grew up immersed in a world of psychology and understanding human motives and desires. But Bernays wasn't purely interested in just studying psychology. He wanted to put it into practice. If he knew people's desires and underlying motivations, you could tell them anything. So after his family moved to the US at the turn of the century, Bernays went to college and began working as a journalist. But his true calling came when he was tasked with promoting a play. His method was genius. Instead of selling it like any other piece of theatre, he marketed it as an advocacy piece for orphanages. He gave people a real reason to care and transferred their strong feelings for the issue straight onto his product. It was an insanely effective model and it just kept working. He sold ballet to Americans by emphasising its sex appeal. He made an opera singer into a household name by spreading rumours about the extreme lengths he took to keep his singing voice intact. Soon enough, Bernays realised his skills were being wasted on just theatre alone, and so he would spend some time working for the US government during World War I, helping them sell the war to the American people. Afterwards, he spent time as a consultant for companies, telling them how to sell their products based on people's real desires. Once, when Bernays was asked to market cigarettes to women, he came up with such a devious solution. His first campaign played on social pressure and body image. He marketed cigarettes as an alternative to snacks, along with pictures of beautiful thin women to sell the ideal. And it worked, but there was still a stigma around women smoking in public. And so, to get around this, Bernays' next campaign was even more deceptive. He sold cigarettes as torches of freedom, convincing women that smoking was a way to stand up to society and its inequality. He planned to paid actors in a women's march, then made them all take out their cigarettes at once. Obviously, this was all nonsense. Cigarettes have nothing to do with empowerment or equal rights. But by tying them in with the issue, he made the American tobacco company an absolute fortune. Bernays works at the foundations for modern marketing, but despite pretty much founding an entire industry, this wasn't Bernays' most impactful work. Instead, that would come with his work in shaping the mindset that would decide the rest of the 20th century. Bernays' style of marketing pioneered appealing to people's base emotions and desires, rather than their rational mind, and it couldn't have come at a more pressing time in history. The Industrial Revolution was still going strong in America in the 20s, but there was a growing problem around the corner. People just weren't buying enough products to keep up with this industrial growth. People operated on a needs basis. If you didn't need something, then there wasn't really point in buying it. But Bernays changed this. By using his marketing techniques, companies could convince people based on their emotions that they wanted something that they didn't really need. A product could be as useless and wasteful as possible. So long as you can make people feel like they needed it, it didn't really matter. Just like with the torches of freedom, companies across the US started selling to people's emotions and their fears and anxieties. People started buying what they desired rather than what they needed. And this is the moment where consumerism was born in America, and rationality started to fade away. Hundred years later, and now we're seeing the awful effects of this fundamental shift. People are completely controlled by their impulses and their desires. Long-term planning is given away to instant gratification, and it's men that are worst affected. You see, when you look back at pictures from just a couple of decades ago, the men from before actually look like men. Today, not so much. People today look like boys in comparison, like they never grew up. It's an impression that's supported by the data. Testosterone, the chemical that prompts sexual maturity and muscle growth in men, is in rapid decline. A study from 2013 found that average testosterone levels in men had fallen by 1% every year since 1980. And there are huge problems with this lack of testosterone. People don't enjoy working hard. People have no confidence, no ambition, no destiny. And there's a bunch of health problems associated with low testosterone, like some kinds of cancer that have risen due to the sharp decline in testosterone, which is in conjunction with sperm counts dropping like a stone. Clearly something very wrong is happening right now, but it's hard to pinpoint exactly what's causing this mass feminization. But there's a lot of suspects, and the truth is likely a combination of a multitude of things. But one of the main things is the massive amounts of chemicals that's tricking men's bodies into making estrogen, leading to around half of men now having gynecomastia, 
where their nipples become packed with estrogen and start to develop like a woman. I mean, estrogen is the hormone that causes your body to develop female characteristics. And so why is this happening all of a sudden? Gynecomastia was really not that common 50 years ago, 100 years ago, and it'd be extremely rare. But now almost every man you walk past has some form of gynecomastia. And this problem is coming from all the untested and poorly regulated chemicals that we're putting into our environment and our bodies. People often talk about avoiding BPA, a certain type of plastic, but it's not that simple. Studies have shown that a massive proportion of plastics have what's called estrogenic activity. Chemicals released as these materials break down trick the body's hormone receptors into thinking they're estrogen. And in people, this is causing a wide range of nasty health effects. But the common ones are weight gain, reduced fertility, sex drive, and sperm counts, and even increased rates of breast and prostate cancer. And we're just talking plastics here. The other sources of common chemicals with estrogen activity is too long to list. But one of the most sinister is astrazine. It comes from the most common herbicide in the US, which gets sprayed on three quarters of cornfields as well as a ton of other common crops. Once it's there, it can leach into the groundwater and eventually make its way into the reservoirs and the water supply. And so much of this chemical has been used that we now even find it in the rainwater. Ever since the late 90s, we've known that it causes feminization and increased estrogen production in animals. More recent studies have shown strong links to low fertility and sperm counts in areas where astrazine is used, as well as a bunch of other issues with the reproductive of organs upon exposure. And with so much estrogen around, you won't be surprised to hear that it's actually in your water supply. And one of the major sources of this is from female birth control pills. You see, the body only absorbs a small amount of the hormone when it enters the body. Around 90% of the estrogen content of the pill goes straight through, and there it enters the wastewater supply, where it's often filtered and then sent back into the drinking supply or into the rivers and oceans. And this can have a devastating effect. In some studies, fish populations in a lake with high levels of estrogen were almost completely wiped out. Just five nanograms per liter has a negative effect. Some rivers and streams in the UK have had levels 12 times that. The estrogen then interfered with the reproductive organs of the fish. And in some cases, male fish even grew ovaries. In humans, estrogen has less severe but similar effects. The amplification of female characteristics and the suppression of the male is something we're seeing all across the West. And this isn't just happening from birth control pills in the water supply. A massive portion of waterborne estrogen comes from livestock. Either it comes from their own natural hormones or from the massive doses of estrogen we get them on top of that. A large amount of cows are also fed on soy. And this is great economically for farmers, but just like in us, most of it doesn't get absorbed and gets deposited in their manure. Then it gets into the water supply through the groundwater and the waste system. Or it gets deposited in food when farmers use the manure to fertilize their crops. And in a perfect world, this wouldn't be an issue at all. But old, underfunded water infrastructure can't filter it out. In lots of countries, water companies have forgone filtration entirely, dumping raw sewage straight into the rivers, lakes, and seas. And so you should probably buy a water filter if you haven't done already. But it's not just this. Plastic trash and other estrogenic chemicals are everywhere. On average, the world makes around 400 million tons of plastic trash every year, with a large part of the waste making its way into the atmosphere and the oceans. It's yet another way that we're drifting further and further away from the natural life that we're adapted for. Sunlight's another good example. Before, nearly everyone got hours of sunlight every day, waking up to the sun and going to bed when the sun started to fade away. But today, most jobs are inside, locking people in grey office cubicles or dark warehouses for eight hours a day, all under artificial lighting, never really seeing the sun at all. I mean, the vast majority of people in the world are too exhausted to spend enough time outside after work. Instead, they will spend their few hours off vegetating in front of a screen, never really having artificial light, only having light from screens, being sat on their ass, never really moving their blood in their body either. And vitamin D deficiency today is an obvious problem. Around a billion people are deficient and in adults it can make you tired, depressed and weak destroying your testosterone. And high levels of body fat make you so much more susceptible. Fat cells store vitamin D and keep it isolated from the bloodstream. And considering that four out of every 10 Americans are obese, this is a major problem. Obesity is probably the most visible negative effect of modern society. There's never existed in human history before, and there's a symptom of everything wrong with our modern diet and lifestyle. And just like with vitamin D, it generally makes everything worse. And we all know the problems it causes, and there's just too many to list in this video. But the first thing on the CDC's list is quite literally all causes of death. For men specifically though, it's been shown to lower testosterone levels, increase estrogen production, and generally damage sexual health. Returning to a normal weight though has been shown to improve if not reverse these effects. Now there's a million reasons for the obesity crisis. 
but our modern sedentary life is obviously a huge part of this. However, processed food is especially damaging here. A recent study of over 9,000 people has shown that protein is absolutely key. The body bases hunger and the desire for more food off protein intake. Stuffed with fats, sugar, salt, carbs, and chemicals, protein is hard to find in nearly all processed food, but it tricks the body into thinking it isn't full, leading to overeating on fattening food and eventually obesity. People who had a protein-rich breakfast ate less during the day, and people who ate processed food throughout the day were, on average, the fattest. One of the worst effects of obesity, though, is the effect on your mental health. Anyone who's lost a decent amount of weight can tell you how differently people treat you, from strangers to people you see every day. People seen as more attractive obviously have more success in their love lives, but they're also seen as being smarter, better at their jobs, attractive people even get lighter sentences for the same crimes. It's an unconscious bias that all humans have, and other than dealing with the consequences, there's there's not really much you can do about it. Studies have shown that the judgement happens almost instantly, even when people are told to focus on something else. In all likelihood, it's another leftover from prehistoric man. Because at the end of the day, who would you trust to help you hunt for food or build a shelter? And this will affect you today. In fact, people base their whole identity around how they think other people see them. This subconscious process, first described by the sociologist Charles Cooley, is called the looking glass self. You see, every time you interact with someone else, your brain sees subtle changes in their face and the way they talk to you. Based on thousands of these moments, you slowly build an idea of how people see you. People change their looks, the things they do, and the image of themselves all based on how they think other people are viewing them. And so if you're obese, if you'd never get sunlight, if you're pasty white stuck in an empty office cubicle, especially early on in life, then this all gets thrown out of balance. You notice people's poorly hidden looks, or the way other kids tend to avoid you, and this then impacts your sense of how people see you as a man. Then if you develop a poor image of yourself, it's incredibly hard to root it out. People might just be acting normally around you, but because of a warped self-image, you'll still perceive the feedback as negative. This combined with the negative effects of obesity on brain chemistry is the reason that obesity is actually destroying many, many people in our society. Men aren't just getting weaker though, they're getting dumber as well. Processes that started centuries ago, combined with some modern differences, have made people dumber and more ignorant than ever. And it all began in America. Now for a nation who calls themselves the greatest in the world, it's not surprising that American culture is woefully ignorant to the outside world. And this isolation began early on. One of the most active and powerful political movements in the 1800s was called the Know Nothing Party. Nationalistic and fearful of anything foreign, they pioneered a political platform based on blaming immigration for the nation's problems. They blamed Irish and Italian immigrants, as well as Catholicism. They spread outlandish conspiracy theories about their opponents and pushed their religious beliefs into education. At their peak, they had over 100 congressmen among their ranks, along with state governors, lawmakers, and thousands of other politicians. Although short-lived, the Know Nothing Party laid the groundwork for the American fear of outsiders and their devoted belief that they were superior, but it was their promotion of willful ignorance that has had the most lasting effect within the country. I'm going to name as many countries as you can. Um, Africa. You can't name one? One country. South America, North America. So you can't name one country on this map? No, I can't. Antarctica. And 100 years later, and the same ideas and values had come to the forefront again. Just as the world was opening up after World War II, America closed itself off. This time, it was their obsession with communism and the Red Menace that caused it. While America spread their culture to a war-torn world, it didn't go the other way. Hollywood had the largest budgets and hadn't been interrupted by getting invaded or bombed, so American movies could easily outperform any foreign one. When Americans then built infrastructure in other countries as part of their aid packages, their culture would always come along with it, and it never went the other way. So with the history of nationalism and the menace of communism to be suppressed, barely anything foreign could reach the eyes and ears of Americans. If it conflicted with their stringent religious values, or even had a whiff of communism about it, America's censors didn't let it through. Fears about communist subversion and infiltration got so bad that a baseball team renamed themselves from the Cincinnati Reds to avoid links with communism. Psycho and its grim shower scene left such a mark on culture because, apart from being so well executed, it was completely unprecedented for American audiences. Prior to 1960, even a little splash of blood and gore was completely banned within all American movies. The censorship was just too strong to let in. 
And Americans really never travel much outside of their country either, meaning that everything you could want to do or see is still within your own borders. You could explore massive cities, scorching deserts, snow-covered mountains, and lush forests without ever having to leave the country. I mean, even in 1994, only 10% of Americans even owned a passport. This might be a bit misleading though, as international flights weren't accessible for most anyway. Also, it's only recently that you actually need a passport to go to Mexico or Canada. And so since then, it's risen to over 40%. However, 40% is still incredibly low. I mean, for reference, 76% of the UK population has a passport, and even Canada has a 70% passport ownership rate. And so all of these combining factors led to the sanitized, completely inwardly focused culture of America today. Even today, the best performing foreign film in America is Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon, which was released in 2000. To put that into perspective, it's not even in the top 500 on the US domestic box office rankings when you include their own movies. And all of this was made so much worse by the rampant consumerist culture of America. As the wave of American culture hit foreign shores, it brought all of their products and brands with it as well. Bernays work on branding and marketing made them spread like wildfire. With their own countries bombed to hell or still not industrialized, people across the world were eager to live like Americans. Over time, the rest of the world got fully immersed in American culture and consumerism. From Australia to Africa and everywhere in between, you could easily watch an American movie and chow down on American fast food. Fast food that was packed with estrogen and other demasculating chemicals. Today, the list of countries without a McDonald's gets shorter every year, and you can get a nice refreshing Coke pretty much anywhere. Anything estrogenic, anything that will poison your body, you will be sure to find has come from America and landed in your shores. But with consumerism came the inevitable downsides. Greed and materialism became the norm. It's not that there weren't greedy people before, the American system just gave them a way to push it to the max. Worldwide obesity rates tripled as well, adding in to more demasculation across the world. It's not just obesity of course, all of modern society's awful effects on your body will impact your looking glass self. Because certain aspects of modern life don't just interfere with your health, they actively undermine your ability to focus and think clearly. As we all know by now, social media ruts your brain. It makes you more likely to be depressed, but more importantly, it destroys your attention span like many of us have experienced. And this is all based on dopamine. This system that's meant to push animals towards certain behaviors has been taken advantage of and hijacked. As many of us know, these short little TikTok videos, Instagram posts, girls and bikinis, the next YouTube podcast, all triggers little dopamine releases on a constant small scale. But over time, as we continue to consume so much of this content, after the next notification, the next Tinder swipe, the next YouTube video, you start to build up a resistance. You start needing more and more dopamine to get that same feeling. For drug users, this means taking a bigger dose. But for social media, it means spending more and more time in front of the screen. It stimulates the release we get from socializing with each other. Every like, retweet, and follower is another little boost, another little dose of dopamine. And over time our dopamine resistance builds up and social media starts to outweigh everything else and that's when you're left with a generation of people who can't go 10 minutes without checking their phone. But that's not the only way social media is rotting people's brains. Short form content platforms like Instagram, Twitter and TikTok are especially damaging because they provide a better alternative when it comes to dopamine efficiency. The brain likes things that are easy, that don't need much investment and won't require too much time. In nature this would be beneficial. The animals that can save the most energy will be the most ready to outrun a predator, will control their hierarchy. But in our consumerist, warped, modern world, this natural impulse has already been turned on its head, just like everything else. Short form content is so addictive because it gives you a similar dopamine for far less effort. Why read a newspaper or watch a film when you can watch the first five seconds of a few hundred TikToks instead? When you step back, it seems ridiculous, but in every decision to watch another one, there's a logical reason your brain carried on swiping. It justifies it as being such a small investment that it may as well watch another one and squeeze out a little more entertainment. And this subconscious loop carries on and on, and before you know it, you've lost an hour or two. Nothing is ever good enough for the brain because it's always adapting to what you give it. And over time, the brain then builds up more of a resistance. People then double down by watching more and more and more, using more social media, more Tinder swipes, more OnlyFans videos, more TikToks. You get into this dystopian point where you get family clips mixed in with subway surfers in the background, helping people numb themselves even more, inducing the public into a brainless trance to absorb more 10 second clips. And so it's easy to think that the internet could reverse all of this culture isolation and give people a broader mindset about the world. And yet in many ways, the access to information 
has given people a more global outlook. It's the easiest it's ever been to interact with other cultures or make friends over long distances. But the way people take in information about the world hasn't really changed at all. In fact, it's gotten even more one-dimensional and insular, constantly distracted, going from one topic to another with the swipe of your screen. And on average, people never get any deep knowledge from the internet and stay stuck in their isolated bubble. In considering more than two thirds of American teenagers use TikTok and nearly 20% say they're on it almost constantly, this isn't a good sign. This endless supply of empty entertainment makes everything else seem dull in comparison, sucking kids' attention, wonder, ambition, and experience of life. On a wider scale, it's changing how we learn things. Getting your information about the world from short form content does teach you a lot about different things, but because of how people consume it, it's rare that anything ever actually sticks. And even if you do remember some of the details, it only ever amounts to surface level knowledge. And this then develops echo chambers, where you're always provided surface level knowledge, extracted from an algorithm designed to evoke your emotions, never giving you any other perspectives, always keeping you in a single lane. And all of this content can usually be incredibly misleading in such a subtle subconscious way. The algorithm's pressure to be as bombastic, outrageous, and alarming as possible means that you never really need to stick to the facts. And some people use this argument of misinformation to say that we shouldn't have free speech anymore, that the Mark Zuckerbergs of the world should control the flow of information. But that's not the issue. The issue is that our speech isn't free enough. People stay in their echo chambers, which has been censored down and watered down by the people running big tech and then people willingly buy into it in this numb passive state. And as almost everyone learns about the news and events in the world by algorithms, then people would start to see a wide range of opinions and arguments if it wasn't for these exact algorithms. They'd have the ability to see the whole issue from every angle. Rather than a 20 word summary of their preconceived opinion, actual in depth knowledge about the subject requires focus and long periods of thought and study. But because people don't have the time or attention span for this, why not just have a chopped up, numbed, empty opinion shoved down your throat. And this is when social media destroys your looking glass self. You see, before the internet, your idea of yourself was solely based on interactions with people in real life. In the close-knit communities we used to live in, these interactions would be based on a deep impression of your character and who you are as a person. That's what our brains evolved to deal with. But social media hijacked this as well by throwing in thousands of judgments and things to feel insecure about every day. Sure, your rational mind knows they're not really directed at you specifically, but all the unconscious parts of your brain don't. And we apply these criticisms and opinions to ourselves without even knowing it. And it impacts the way you build your looking glass self. It might not create new insecurities, but it definitely amplifies them. They act as limiters on people, drains on their confidence that push them towards inaction and overthinking. And it's this process that's the most damaging to men. How many of the great men of the future are already being undermined by some anonymous idiot's opinion, made to feel inadequate because they don't meet an arbitrary high requirement or because they haven't slept with enough people. Ironically, the dumbest people won't stop to think about these things anyway, shielding them from the worst of it. They'll keep happily going through life while smarter people get lost in overthinking and retreat into themselves. And we live in a time where information is easier to access than ever, but it doesn't matter for most. All of these different pressures are making people more ignorant. And that's no wonder politicians now talk to people like they're children, because that's what works now. And it hit me recently that communities, small tribes of people coming together, resisting all of this modern bullshit and rethinking our position in all of this is actually what's essential to overcoming these very obstacles. You see, instead of continuing to live in a world where your desires, purposes, and routine is dictated by faceless corporations thousands of miles away from you, what you really need is a small community of like-minded people. This is what men have had throughout thousands of years of human history. And on YouTube, I've been able to go over some of these modern issues you see. Men becoming weaker, our 1984 society, a warped habitus that destroys our own thinking, whilst also trying to mix in some of the teachings of the best philosophers and religious stories out there to get more meaningful solutions than just having a cold shower to modern problems. I mean, it's literally been years now that I've been talking endlessly about the unprecedented levels of loneliness, purposelessness in modern society, and how this is driving us towards behaviors like social media addiction and other toxic behavior. Because personally, I've struggled with this while trying to build my YouTube channel. I got so lost in distractions despite knowing better. And you see, the thing is, this isn't a problem of a lack of information here. It's our mindset. Mindset. It's our cultural mindset. And that's why I've spent years diving into philosophy, psychology, and sociology to understand and change the fundamental layers of my mind that were holding me back. And the result was for me personally, was that I was able to change my routine. I was able to break free from the grip of procrastination and managed to build a successful YouTube channel in around two years that I truly think has positively impacted many, many lives judging by the thousands of comments like this that I've received. And while I have been able to share some of this knowledge through my videos, the format of these videos limits how deep I can really go here. The YouTube algorithm, the style of video essay, 
the topics. It doesn't allow me to go as deep as I really want to. Because deep down, I really want to offer something more comprehensive to help people on a very personal level, to change our lives together, being actually in a community of like-minded people. And so I've been thinking about this for ages and how I could actually enact this, where I could talk on a more personal level to you and others like you and me about these topics in big discussions, without constant editing, without music, just raw conversation. And I realized that the only way really to do this is to build a community, which is why after a long time of thinking about it, I finally created my own community called the Moon School of Living. Now, before I get into telling you about it all, it will have a monthly membership fee that you need to pay for. So if you're really struggling right now during this economic recession, or you're unable to take care of yourself properly, by all means, just ignore this message and really enjoy my regular videos and don't worry much about this. But if you're not in this situation, I do really want to tell you about this project I've been working on because this is the first product I've ever made. And I truly think you've never seen anything like this before. So to be clear, what do I actually mean by community? Well, the school is a community that I've created using a site called School. It's an expensive site and it's nothing like Discord or Reddit or anything like that. You don't get trolls, memes or shit posts. This is a high quality environment of a very small community of people. Right now, I'm trying to keep it as small as possible to make it a much higher value environment where everyone who joins in takes it seriously as we come together for three weekly calls where we go over modernity, philosophy, social media addiction, money and things like how I built my YouTube channel where I can give advice to other aspiring creators. And all these calls are then recorded and uploaded so you can access them anytime you miss the calls or want to rewatch them. In addition, there's multiple courses coming out in this community on geopolitics, modernity, video editing, loneliness, money, just to name a few. And sometimes in the calls, we'll just talk about anything that's relevant today, anything that me and you think's worth talking about. And sometimes there might be times where I can't really make the call, but for the foreseeable future, I'll always be doing this. And if not, there'll be advanced warning. And soon we're gonna have other people like What If Alt Hist coming in and giving discussions on things he's more knowledgeable about. And the best part of this school so far is feeling like you're not alone with this stuff. I mean, just recently we had some great discussions about deconditioning our thinking from our twisted culture. I mean, we ended up talking about psychedelics and people who've experienced ayahuasca. In another call, I was going over someone's YouTube channel, giving them personal advice for their videos every week. In another, we're talking about Sartre, existential loneliness, social media addiction, and businesses. Already we have some great members on board and it's been great to connect with everyone so personally in this community. And now the school is pricey. It's $99 a month, but this is deliberate. If it was really cheap, it kind of ruined the point of the community as I'm not trying to be a live streamer. I want this to be an extremely high quality premium area for those who want to develop ourselves outside of the confines of modernity and surface level thinking. I'm specifically looking for people who are excited by the idea of coming together, growing, learning, developing, holding each other accountable. People who are excited to fast track the development. That's why I'm working on it all week, in the calls, posting new ideas, making courses, and generating the highest quality community I can possibly make. And so if you think this is a scam or it just seems like too much money, no worries at all. Please just keep enjoying the normal videos and don't worry about joining as it's probably not the place for you. And if you do join and you don't really like it, I'll refund you within seven days of joining and you can cancel at any time afterwards for the following months. It's super easy to cancel. Just DM me or send me an email to our customer service team and you'll get a refund, no questions asked. But I want to end this by saying, if my videos have actually been meaningful for you and you found value in some of the ideas I've discussed, imagine going the next step beyond this, where you're part of a close-knit community, a small little tribe, where I know you by name, where I've watched your progress over the past six months, and I'm genuinely proud of your growth. If this excites you as much as it does for me, please feel free to check it out by using the top link in the description below to get involved. 